Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to the um, regular meeting of the Board of Trustees for the Utah Transit Authority. I'm joined by my uh, colleagues, Beth Holbrook and Jeff Acerson. And in today's uh, Wednesday, uh, May the 12th of 2021, um, for members of the public who would like to make a live comment, they're welcome to register through the uh, link on our website and we'll be happy to accommodate them when that uh, time comes. Certainly we welcome comment and any comment we see previously was distributed um, to the board. Um, with, uh, since this is the all electronic meeting, we'll ask Jenna Osler if she'll read the electronic meeting determination statement. Uh, Jenna. Thank you, Chair. This is the electronic board meeting determination consistent with the Utah Open and Public Meetings Act. As the chair of the Board of Trustees of the Utah Transit Authority, I hereby make the following written determinations in support of my decision to hold electronic meetings of the UTA board without a physical anchor location. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, conducting board and board committee meetings with an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at the anchor location. Federal, state, and local health authorities continue to encourage institutions and individuals to limit in-person interactions. This written determination takes effect on May 12, 2021 and is effective until midnight on June 11, 2021 and may be reissued by future written determinations as deemed appropriate. Dated the 7th day of May, 2021, signed Carlton Christensen. Thank you, Jenna. Oh. Uh, we'll next then uh, move to our uh, safety first minute. And with that, we welcome uh, Sheldon Shaw. Good morning, Sheldon. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, trustees. Back in 1962, President John F. Kennedy designated May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day to recognize those police officers who have been killed in the line of duty. It's also an opportunity to recognize the great work that police do for society someone calls 911 in an emergency, it's police officers who go rushing in. Mr. Chair, I'm not able to hear Sheldon at all. Oh, sorry, Sheldon. You have a great message. We were having a little difficulty hearing you. My apologies. Can you hear me now? No, that's a little worse. Let's see. Sorry about that. You have a great message. All right, Mr. Chair, can you hear me now? Uh, it, it's still challenging, but why, why don't you go ahead? Eric, can I ask a point of order just for a second? We have a little technical issue. Um, can you give me Sorry, a Sheldon. second? We'll, we'll come back to you, Sheldon. Don't go away. Thanks everybody for your patience.
Um, Chair, can you confirm for me that you can see the shared presentation? Uh, yes. Yes, I can. And you can hear everyone, correct? Uh, yes, I've been able to hear everybody. E even children I was able to hear, it just was faint. Okay. So the issue we're having for some reason is that the, um, the video of the speakers is not showing up on the WebEx that is projecting to Granicus. So we can okay. still hear and we can still see the presentation. We just can't see the speakers. So okay. I think you can I, go ahead and continue and I can try and fix that. But it yeah. may be that we won't have video of the speakers. Okay. Well, that won't be the end of the world as long as we have the audio version and, and just we'll make sure people identify themselves um, at least when they begin to speak. So. Yeah, that would be great. And I'll see okay. if we can fix it. Thank you. Uh, okay. Sheldon, uh, you have a great message. Will you start from the beginning? Just I uh, uh, want to make sure we get it fully included. I will, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I'll try to speak up in order to be heard. I apologize for whatever issues we're having here. I was just trying to recognize that May 15th is Police Officers Memorial Day. It's an opportunity for us to recognize those police officers who were killed in the line of duty. And also to say thank you to police officers for the great work that they do. When we call 911, it's police officers who respond to the scene and try to protect life and property. And a shout out to Chief Ross and the Transit Police at EPA who do a great job of making sure that our system and our facilities are safe. Appreciate the opportunity, Joe. Thank you, Sheldon, and thanks for that reminder. I uh, occasionally been in Washington during the Peace Officer Memorial time, and it's certainly uh, a very touching experience to watch. Uh, the women and men who serve uh, in so many different roles and certainly to our own transit police. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll go to public comment. And um, uh, Jenna, do we have anybody here from the public that would like to make comments? I'm not seeing or hearing anything. Okay. Well, I'll presume that there's not. If somehow we've missed somebody, we'll certainly come back to that. Uh, why don't we move then to the consent agenda, which is approval of our minutes from April 28th of 2021. With that, I would entertain a motion on that, the consent agenda. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the consent agenda items. I'll second that. I have a motion from uh, Beth, seconded by Jeff, uh, for approval. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, the motion passes. Thank you. Uh, next up is our agency report. And with that, we'll turn to our executive director, Carolyn Gunnar. Good morning, Carolyn. Good morning. Um, just a couple items um, today um, that I just want to briefly mention. Uh, one is, is the public hearing uh, for the August change day. Um, we are currently holding a public comment period through May 28th on proposed service changes for this August. Um, this evening at 6 p.m. we'll be holding a virtual public hearing on the proposed changes to share details on the suggested changes UTA is considering and to answer questions and to hear the public comments. Um, the event will be held on Zoom and registration is required. So more information, registration can be found at rideuta.com slash August changes. Um, and then um, we'll have other opportunities to get involved um, in terms of public comment as well. So we'll be continue to publicize that. Um, then for Vineyard, um, as you're aware, tomorrow at 2 p.m. in Vineyard, we're holding a groundbreaking event. Um, with Vineyard City and UDOT to announce the start of construction of the new front runner Vineyard Station, as well as the start of work on an additional 1.8 miles of new double tracking north of the future station. And this is the first front runner mainline track and station expansion project since the opening of the front runner south in 2012. Um, funding from the station comes from $4 million appropriated in the 2018 legislative session, with an additional $1.6 million appropriated during the 2021 legislative session. UTA is contributing 16.9 million to cover the cost of the double tracking. 
Um, construction will begin this month with a completion targeted at the end of this year. Um, the speakers at the groundbreaking include the representatives from Utah Legislature, UDOT, Vineyard City, and UTA, and we are hosting that event. So um, I know many of you will, at least two of you will be there, and maybe all three. So I'm excited about um, um, this event and this groundbreaking for this um, project on Front Runner. So that concludes my report. Uh, thanks, Carolyn, and thanks uh, to you and uh, members of your staff for working through the issues here. I think you got faced with this challenge pretty early on in your uh, arrival and uh, have been patient in helping us work through this. So this will be a great, great day for the agency. So thank you. Um, with you. that, with that uh, we'll move to our financial report and for March of 2021. And with that, we welcome our CFO, uh, Bill Green. Uh, Bill, good morning. Good morning, Chair Christensen, uh, board members Acerson Holbrook. For the record, Bill Green, the CFO. Um, Brad Armstrong's on vacation today, well earned vacation, so hopefully he's enjoying the sun. I'll be presenting the report today. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here's the summary dashboard. Uh, remember, there's a one month lag in our sales uh, tax reporting from the state. Sales tax in February continue to exceed expectations, uh, higher by about 11%. There was a bit of an anomaly in the 2020 sales tax reporting from the state, which I'll get into in a moment. So uh, it skews the percentage a little bit, but still overall, strong construction activity and stimulus fuel spending are contributing factors to a very positive forecast. I think Eddie described at the last board meeting, there's some optimism around ridership and our relatively strong performance in this area as compared to budget reflects this. Uh, operating expenses appear to be over budget in March. If you'll see there, it looks like we're over budget by about $6 million. Uh, this apparent overrun is due to some timing issues on some labor related transactions that I'll get to in a moment. Um, but that, that skew the March expenses negatively. The good news is that year to date, we're in very good shape. Uh, when adjusted for these uh, transactions. Uh, diesel prices are on the rise and like all of you, we're experiencing that increase. Uh, the, in March, average monthly prices hit the 250 mark. Who was the wise guy that reduced the budget to 225? I'd like to find that guy. But overall, uh, year to date, we're still slightly below our budget fuel forecast, but more than likely, we're gonna have to rely on some contingency if prices stay at the current levels or increase as many experts are forecasting. And I'll, I'll get into a little more detail on the fuel in a moment. Any questions on the dashboard before I proceed? No, but we'll, uh, I think we all jointly lowered the gas price. <laughs> so you don't have to take the full burden of that, Bill. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, all right, next slide, please. So again, uh, this is the sales tax uh, chart and you'll recall the uh, green bars are the budget, the blue bars are the actuals, and then the shading in the background reflects the 2020 experience. So you can see um, that we're doing quite well and it, it's not really apparent because the uh, scale for the cumulative on the right side is so small, but you can see that we're trending ahead. I think once we get out a few more months, you'll be able to see, see more graphically the, the split between the projection, the current projection and the actuals. Um, at our next meeting on May 26th, Professor Bannister of the University of Utah will be reporting to you the results of his modeling efforts to establish our new official UTA sales tax forecasts. Our results are very encouraging and 2021 sales tax forecasts in his forecast, which he'll detail. I don't want to steal his thunder too much, but they are expected to exceed the 5% growth that we had forecast for 2021. So it's, a, it's going to be a very interesting presentation. I'm really looking forward to it. Any questions on sales taxes? All right, next slide, please. Okay, the sales tax collections again. Um, we continue to see very strong sales tax performance in Utah, Davis, Weber, Tuella, and Box Elder counties uh, related to strong construction activity and consumer purchases that are partly driven and I guess to a great extent driven by stimulus funding. So again, very, very positive performance. Any questions? Next slide, please. 
Uh, passenger revenues, again, I mentioned this earlier, but year to date, the passenger revenues uh, are doing quite well. In March, it was a little bit below with total fare revenue year to date, about 7.6 compared to our budgeted forecast of about 7.9. We're a negative variance of about 4%. This $3 million variance is primarily caused by lower than budgeted revenues from our past programs, fare pay, uh, TVMs and past sales. Um, and sometimes that's a timing issue. But I think we've had several conversations about some of the uh, steps we're taking with our major customers to move. Some of them are moving to a, a paper use, uh, paper ride type uh, approach rather than the than the uh, agreement lump sum agreement. But uh, we expect that uh, to stabilize over the year, go down a little bit, and then hopefully as the recovery kicks in. Uh, we'll 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 see higher ridership and the corresponding higher fares, um, but again, overall, we're expecting lower fare revenues for some of our largest pass programs as they move to the paper ride pay method of payment. Uh, next slide, please. Any sorry, I'm sorry. Any questions on the fares? Next slide. Thank you. On the stimulus funds, um, again, very very good for good pretty tight forecast. Uh, good job. Uh, March year to date, our revenues are about uh, 11% or about four and a half million dollars lower than budget. This is primarily due to a February decision that we made to um, process a, a, an amendment to our federal grant that would allows us to uh, fund preventive maintenance with the uh, stimulus funds. Uh, this, this preventive maintenance cost hasn't been accrued yet, so that's what's leading to this variance. You'll see in April a, a large spike in that uh, in that green line and the actual line that will be blue in April that shows when once we accrue those funds from the feds, you'll see we'll be right back on track. And in fact, this is gonna help us uh, accelerate the spend down for both CARES, CRISA, and when we get our new ARPA grant as well. Any questions? Okay, we'll actually, we should actually exceed this plan for spend down of these two funds. At this point on this graphic, the only two funds that are shown are CARES and CRISA. We are not showing the stimulus funds yet. We're still getting some guidance from the Fed. Some guidance just came out this week. So probably next month's presentation will update you on the ARPA uh, stimulus funds. Bill, is it anticipated that those uh, ARPA funds would just fall sort of right after the CRISA funds or can you draw those down simultaneous to the CRISA funds? Uh, we, we, the plan right now would be to do them sequentially. So because we're using them relative basically for the same activities, you know, operations and preventive maintenance as we exhaust the CRISA probably in July, then we'll exhaust, excuse me, exhaust the CARES in July. We're then anticipating we would exhaust the CRISA a little bit earlier than shown here, maybe September, early September, and then we would kick into the ARPA. Still, still some decisions will be coming back to you uh, to discuss some options of how we would draw those funds down and accelerate those fund drawdowns. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Next slide, please. All right, the operating financial results. Um, operating expenses year to date through the end of March were under budget by about $5 million, 7% um, thereabouts. As described below in the, for, uh, in the fringe, we had a payroll accrual of approximately a million and a half dollars that was budgeted in April that was booked early, so it hit March's expenses. So you can see in the fringe there, there's there's quite a large overrun of about through almost three million dollars. That will be corrected as we go into April because that 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 expense is already hit and it won't hit in April. So April will show an underrun in that area, but the year to date will be in balance and we, we project we're going to be in pretty good shape. Likewise, on the salary and wages, you recall last month Brad explained that we had a payroll accrual that we did not uh, complete in time to hit March's records. It actually hit in April, so you've got an extra some extra funds here in April and extra payroll. And you can see there that uh, some of those salary and wages again over by about 26%. Um, that that brings us current on salary and wages. So if you look to the right under the current year results, you'll see we're about 3% under, which is a pretty good place to be. So in summary, the salary and wages are all caught up with the corrections that we need to make. The fringe won't be caught up until next month. And then you should see a positive fringe variance next month. Um, let's see, uh, non-labor costs, 
Uh, non labor is about 5.3 million favorable, due primarily to a positive variance, about $2 million in services, about a million six in other, and a million six in parts, uh, with smaller amounts spread across other categories. Some of this is timing, and it will be caught up as the year goes, but I think we're in pretty good shape here as well. Uh, so some of these positive variances were offset by negative variances in utilities, which was a timing issue, which we'll correct next year as we perfect our aging uh, of the budget. Uh, we didn't anticipate correctly the, you know, the typical peak in January and February for energy. Uh, we'll, we'll fix that next year. Uh, so let me go to fuel here. So the Federal Reserve is expecting a strong U.S. economic recovery, which is positive for demand expectations and price. I think what I'm reading is that there's a bit of a positive outlook here. Uh, the current market condition is that uh, global demand is expected to grow over the next eight months by some 6 million barrels a day they're anticipating as the vaccinations around the world bring an end to COVID and economies accelerate. Uh, this has already started to happen, especially in China and the United States. So it's really not a question of uh, whether demand is going to grow dramatically, but What's going to be that pattern of growth along the way? We've read about the difficult times in India and other countries creating a weakness in demand over the short term. Um, but uh, OPEC is starting to increase supplies, um, so we'll see. But as OPEC uh, feeds this rapid demand growth, some of this production capacity naturally will disappear, which is, again, positive for price. And again, on the on the U.S. side, uh, as demand and prices increase, uh, maybe our shale production may increase, but it's going to need an investment uh, injection of investment to sustain the production levels above where they are now. U.S. production is still about two million barrels a day lower than the pre pandemic level. So, all in all, um, you know, not as positive as we would hope, but I think there is some hope for uh, maybe moderating fuel increase prices again. The situation on the East Coast, uh, it just takes one one incident and all of a sudden that can have a huge impact on fuel. So uh, very difficult to forecast, and, uh, but that's where we are with fuel. Uh, any questions on uh, operating financials? Uh, Sorry, Go ahead, thank Jack. you. Uh, Bill, I had a question about um, First about the utilities, and, and thank you, by the way, for your presentation and kind of that all-encompassing economic snapshot of the United States. That's helpful. Um, I did wonder how that um, situation in the East would, would be impactful to prices world, you know, at least nationwide. So that's helpful. Thank you. But on the utility side, you indicated that there's not this um, full addressing of the nuances, I guess, of the of energy in terms of the winter months. Is that yeah. Um, could you yes, explain yes. it just, yeah, just a little more? Thanks. Certainly. Um, so when we began trying to look at the aging of our budgets by category, uh, the, the, a lot of the categories are basically straight line and, and utilities was no no exception. And, and we traditionally experience higher than normal. You know, if you had that curve, it would be very high in the January, February time period and then kind of lowering and peaking again in the summer. And then again, kind of uh, uh, flattening out, and then again peaking in December. So uh, our our budget aging did not reflect that. By the time we caught up with it, uh, January and February were kind of already in the book. So we've re-aged the budget going forward, but we didn't go back to correct everything. So this is basically a, a we we should have done a better job of aging those budgets. Is what I should say. Instead of straight lining them, we should have been, we should have reflected the variability and the high use in the winter. Um, and that's helpful to understand a little bit more about that. And because I I mean I know you're aware we're getting these electric buses going that are going to be coming in not this year but next year. And so I'm just curious as to how all of that's going to work as well. So I'm assuming that you're going to kind of calculate that and then do additional calculations based on what those vehicles usage would be as well. Absolutely. That'll be part of our 2022 budget request and you'll probably see an increase in that line item in the budget. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Any other questions on this? Okay. Next slide, please. So the operating expense by mode, again, just kind of another way to look at it. I think uh, that I would just summarize this to say that 
you can see the expense by mode reflects these payroll and benefit issues that I described, the transactions that occurred and didn't occur, um, and then the corrections in February and March. Um, so I think when adjusted for all that, I think the good news here is that all the modes are either at or under budget. So very positive performance by all the modes. Questions here? Okay, next slide, please. That's my favorite slide. <laughs> Any uh, final questions for Bill on his report? Okay. Not seeing any. Bill, thank you for filling in and and uh, and for your full staff and all their work on it. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, next move to item six on our agenda, which is contracts, disbursements, and grants. And the first item up is a contract for purchasing card management services with U.S. Bank. And with that, we welcome Todd Mills. Uh, good morning, Todd. Good morning, Mr. Chair and trustees. I'm excited to bring to you today the uh, contractor uh, for P-Card services for the agency. As you probably know, we've been with Wells Fargo since 2003, and uh, the last contract renewal we did with them was in 2011. Um, so this, uh, we recently went up for RFP and received four proposals from different uh, banks in the Valley. Uh, U.S. Bank was selected as the uh, uh, vendor for these services based on their technical criteria experience, training and support, and also the uh, basis point rebate that they offer. Uh, so this will increase our basis point rebate from the current 0.5% to a 1.85%. Uh, the new contract will also give us some uh, new technology that's available in the industry, which is uh, mobile, uh, a mobile app which will allow users to uh, submit, reconcile, and approve P-card statements and transactions uh, on their phones or, or wherever they're at. They can also take pictures of the receipts, submit them, uh, just things like that will make it a lot easier for us. Uh, this contract will be for five years plus five one-year options. This is longer than uh, a usual contract, as you might know. Uh, usually we, we have standard five years. But due to the complexity involved in changing financial institutions for this type of service, a uh, request was submitted to and approved by the Chief of Procurement Officer, Bill Green, to enter into a longer contract, longer than five years. Uh, because there is no revolving balance, UTA does not pay any fees charged for these services. And a, a, at this point, I uh, ask that you approve the contract with the U.S. Bank and authorize the Executive Director to execute the contract. Any questions? I just want to, and it's a great rate on the re rebate, it seems like. And um, I remember in my past job, it seemed like they were on the state contract and only got 1%. I just wondered whether not, uh, what made you decide to go like versus an RFP versus uh, on the state contract? Do you feel like you, at the end of the day, you got a better deal? Yeah, definitely. We um, There were some technology advancements that we wanted to be able to take advantage of as well. Um, we knew that we were kind of behind the times in that side of things. And then uh, to be quite honest, there's several categories that we find that we actually do better going outside of the state contract and doing our own RFP. This is one of them. Okay. That makes sense. And I, I know it's a hassle to switch a lot of cards over at some point uh, in the future. So. Uh, yeah. Any questions, questions yeah. though, from the board? I just had a quick question. Um, thanks for uh, for kind of looking out at that whole, um, I want to understand what everything out in the market is, because that's what I'm thinking that RFP did for us. Um, I appreciate that. I just, um, I'm curious how that transition, what that timeline, how that structure is in terms of transitioning from one institution to another. Yes, yeah, so we'll probably do it in phases. Um, do some, you know, sections of cards throughout the uh, uh, the launch time frame. Uh, we're hoping to be probably by the end of June or middle of June, somewhere in that time frame, to be able to actually be completely turned over. Um, so it will take a little time. We are actually going to have um, new everyone that's going to be requesting a card. Uh, we'll have to submit a new request and have the manager approve. Um, that's that's because of. Uh, you know, some of these cards we've had out there since 2000 that uh, just hadn't had approvals in such a long time that this will help us kind of identify the correct transaction limits that we want to have and also make sure that we have current management approval. So, 
that'll be kind of incorporated in that transition time, but it should take uh, you know about six weeks is what we're thinking. Oh, six weeks total? Yeah. The transitions from one end to the other? Yeah, as soon as we can print off or give them a list, they can print out the cards pretty quickly, actually. It's a matter of turning it off the old ones and turning on the new ones, and we'll be coordinating that. Oh, that's helpful. Thank you. Any other questions for Todd? Chair, I'm ready to make a motion if, if you're ready. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Jeff. I, I make a motion to approve the contract with U.S. Bank for purchasing management services. Second. I have a motion from Jeff, seconded by Beth, to approve the contract uh, with U.S. Bank as uh, presented. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes. Uh, thank you, Todd, on that. Um, and good good luck in the transition. Thank you. Um, we'll go next to Mary Diloretto and Manjeet Renu, and this is a change order for the front runner forward on call operations planning and simulations assistance uh, task order uh, two with DB Engineering and Consulting USA. Uh, good morning, Mary. Good morning. Um, yes, for in order to support the front runner forward program. We had a competitive procurement to hire an on-call operations planning and simulation um, assistant consultant. And um, through a competitive procurement process, we hired DB Engineering and Consulting back in uh, January, early January this year. We issued task order one to them in the amount of $179,856 to start some work back in January 15th. And now we're ready to issue task order two to help support that effort. And I have Manjeet Ranu here, the director of capital development, as well as Carrie Doan, the manager of long range strategic planning to talk about the task order in more detail and any questions, answer any questions you may have. So I'll turn it over to Manjeet. Thanks, Mary. That was a good overview. So I would suggest um, if the trustees, if you have any questions or comments, uh, Carrie and I would be happy to take those. Can you tell me what the the, the scope difference is for task order two versus one? Or a, a lot of the focus for task order one was to really start to build the build up the model for the front runner system, so then um, various operational simulations could be done and get a better understanding about how the system works. So as we move more into task order two, we get into more granular details such as systems issues like signaling and um, how uh, we can simulate real world operations of front runner. And so there's the, you know, the theoretical about how it moves from across the system and then the reality about how environmental inputs, meaning like the real world, um, plays into how front runner operates and get a sense of um, how the system operates with various improvements that we might um, speculate could be built uh, for improving front runner. So it's to help on the, the iterating as we develop the program and look at improvement packages and, um, and also integrate closely with the program manager of which that contract um, comes to the board for consideration the next meeting in May. And do you anticipate additional task orders with this contract? I mean, obviously, uh, you know, our work's not done. I just wondered, is this like two of many or, or is this sort of bring this aspect of the contract home? It's possible that um, as we move into developing the business plan, which is the overall vision and more um, short range and long range planning for what the front runner system could be that as we get input from stakeholders and partners as including as well as the board um, that will need to do additional work um, but for right now this is a very solid foundation um, but i wouldn't be surprised if there's a if there's additional work that's requested down the road so th this is Carolyn. Um, we, yeah, please, Carolyn. We did hire this firm to help continue to do work. So we have it very task order based. There's a lot of work within this next task order. I will say that. Um, but um, 
we do have the ability to continue to use them over time to take a look at it as we develop the business plan, you know, those activities. So um, that will be managed. You know, there's a lot of value in having a model with the detail that we have right now. Um, sure. So, I, I mean, I don't know, Carrie, do you want to explain sort of the, the thought process of, of bringing them in and having them on call for us? Yes, thank you. For the record, I'm Carrie Doan, the manager of long range and strategic planning. Thank you, Carolyn and Menji and Mary. I think um, the idea we, we have a budget for 2021. Um, if we need their help continued in 2022, we should think about that. Um, we do feel like we can get a number of um, additional scenarios um, modeled in the simulation model in task order two. And so it's a matter of determining kind of how it is interacting with our program management and the degree to which um, projects are being um, kind of dis defined. But the, I, Carolyn's right, once we have this model built, um, the, the, the value of being able to continue to have DB do work for us um, is built into the task order uh, kind of type of contract that we have with them. Does that answer your question? Carolyn? Yeah, no, it, it really does. I just mostly wanted to get a sense of scope, but it makes sense that you'd want to continue their services if there are other refinements or um, uh, situations that you want to review. So, uh, I think, a, sorry, oh, go ahead. Can I no, add go one ahead. thing? Okay. Yeah, um, I think um, w the way we thought about this working is that we have this long corridor and there's a lot of um, um, details that we can, that we still need to um, assess with more like conceptual engineering and stakeholder engagement and other things that are happening outside of this contract. And we'll want to be able to test um, various changes that might come up based on other work. Makes total sense. Uh, Beth, did you have a question? I do, thank you. Um, Carrie, I, I am just curious if when we when we have this modeling completed or, or during its, uh, I guess, development, are they going to be taking into account some of the growth issues um, surrounding the various locations for the front runner? How are they going to look at our overall growth in that area? You mean in terms of like ridership benefits of changes? So, so it's, it's a good question and I want to make a, a pretty uh, specific distinction. This contract is for operations simulation and it basically will allow us to determine how well the system will operate, how well the, uh, the, the service that we test attracts ridership would be a separate and different model and contract. It's, it's the travel demand modeling, um, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, so, the, so Beth, the travel, sure. the, I think Carrie's correct. So the, there's another contract that's the front runner program manager and they'll be doing, so this is very iterative. So as um, say DB engineering defines sections right now, helping us define what are those strategic double track sections we want to do, mm -hmm. then the program manager will, they'll, they'll run the modeling on it. You know, what's the ridership like if we're able to run this kind of service? What is the growth? How does the growth in the region affect that? Um, also, they'd be running, you know, doing the engineering work and the costs if we find something that's maybe needs to be tweaked or this is going to be very difficult to do this double track section is or another piece or can we lengthen it to the south maybe to the north there's all different ways to do it they can do all that work in terms of it but but they are very focused on how does front runner run operations run so as we're out there doing the business plan as we're out there defining this first this front runner forward program over the next five years or so um to, for construction DB is very involved in how does it work in terms of our our track and our signaling and our ability to to run the service plans we are. So it's a very detailed operations model for the for the train system. And then the front runner program manager will be doing all the travel demand modeling, the ridership, the working with you know WFRC and our staff on the land use patterns in, in that area. Thanks. That's helpful to kind of have that definition um, I because it does make sense, of course, to get the infrastructure correct in terms of the operational perspective, because if you can't get that done, then how can anything else 
you know, fall into place. I just, I'm curious though, that some of that modeling would have to, like you said, you, you would have to understand some of that land use or some of at least the growth potential in order to make that operational decision. Is that a fair statement or, or is that, that's really just, it's just really about the infrastructure in this first phase. If I may, um, Beth, it's a great question. And I'd like to assure you that in task order one, we provided DB with a lot of existing ridership information at a station level, and they definitely use that to kind of um, describe to us the way our system works and to recommend kind of um, options for us to consider. So we can do the same thing with any projected ridership, but it would have to be sort of information that comes from outside of DB's um, work themselves. So like the, the program management could provide these land use changes, and these, um, these growth situations that you're talking about. And then we can say, okay, if it happens, here's another uh, service scenario we might consider. Thanks, I appreciate that, that's helpful. I, I, I know I'm kind of looking at it as a chicken and egg and, and, and I know it's probably more structured than that, but it's helpful to understand how that kind of um, initiated and then where that will go from there. So I appreciate all the work you guys have done. Yeah, Trustee Hober, if you're not off a little bit on the chicken and the egg, it is an iterative process. So we, if we provide these improvements, how does it increase ridership? If the ridership increases, or how does it induce growth? If the growth grows, so you know, and Carrie's used to doing this for strategic long range um, planning, but it is a little bit chicken and egg. So you're not, you're not off there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so Chair Christensen, I yeah, please, yeah. Uh, question to that. I, Carolyn, you you I think you said, or at least maybe uh, maybe I read into it more than what you were implying, but I just got through a meeting with some South County mayors in Utah County, and they're very desirous to see front runner extend down to Payson. And and is that part of your modeling to see if if there's an advantage uh, as you look at strategic areas to double track and does does the extension of front runner North, I think you said north and south, or maybe implied that. Is that taken into consideration for efficiency and and the timeliness of the, uh, what we're trying to do with front runner? So this task order, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Carrie. This task order is primarily focused on the the core system we have right now, but the model, like for DV, that could be another task order. That's why we have them on call. We could say, hey, simulate if we went down to to Payson. And what it would be if we had two stations or if we have one if we have a different operating scenario if, if you know where you know those types of things can be done they, they can simulate that kind you know what's the impact on train operations to extend it to the south that's a lot of the effort that they're doing is really what is the impacts on our ability you know our our train system operations should we do these kinds of improvements or extensions well, I think that would be very helpful because I think as we're proceeding and trying to improve efficiencies and look at double tracking, uh, look at, you know, depending on the, the level and the ability to do that, it seems like the modeling, you, you could run some modeling and boy, all of a sudden you, you may see a window of opportunity that presents itself and, and that could be a decision that uh, would help us move forward in a more timely way. So. Appreciate the efforts there. Well, I think maybe even along that line, you would hate to do something in the existing track that somehow comp compounded the problems if you did expand either to the north or south. And I, I, I realize I'm getting back into the chicken and the egg <laughs> uh, <laughs> discussion again. Um, but I, you know, I, hopefully the you know their model, uh, you know, has some. Uh, ability to expand a little bit uh, in the sense of um, you know what not putting some improvement in that later you regret or I don't know maybe you would never regret any improvements but chair Christensen I can I can speak to that um, briefly one of the values of hiring DB for this work is that they actually have two models okay. so have what they call a planning model, which would be very easy to add stations and assess what happens either south or north on our system. And it doesn't take the same level of effort as the operating simulation model, which is much more detailed and much more accurate to how we actually operate trains. So 
that's one of the things we've been taking a lot of advantage of and um, has allowed us to run a lot of different scenarios. So we could definitely do that with their planning model. Okay. And, and one of the things I think you're correct is that, you know, you could put an extension, say, to the south, but it could require improvements that are on the core system that yeah, we wouldn't even expect where we need them. That's the, the, the really the, the benefit of the model of having this, um, the planning and the simulation assistance model is that's what yeah. really helps us yeah, as that, well. I think that does address my question. And, and you know, I, I think especially as we do that sharp tintic um, assimilation, you know, you, um, anyway, it just seems like at some point we should look at that, it, you know, before we did a lot of heavy construction, just to make sure we weren't doing something we later regretted or had to go back and change uh, significantly, but anyway. That's a good question, because in the north, uh, northern side, obviously Ogden and, and Weber County are looking at BDO. They're already trying to get that yeah. corridor purchased. And so, yeah, that I think this is uh, very helpful. So thanks, I mean, everybody. They're all great problems to have so <laughs> to, to address at some point in time when life uh, pays for itself. Um, other questions on this actual task order or change order? Yeah. Uh, thank you all for the discussion and responding to the questions. Uh, with that, I would entertain a motion for uh, approval on this uh, change order. Mr. Chair, I'd love to make a motion that we um, approve the change order for the front runner forward on call operations, the planning and simulation assistance task order two with DB Engineering and Consulting US. I'll second that. I have a motion from Beth, uh, seconded by Jeff to approve the change order. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes, thank you. Uh, with that, we'll go to uh, item C, which is a change order on the depot district final design with Scantec architecture. And with that, we welcome back Mary Deloretto as well as uh, I think uh, Dave Osborne. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, this this change order is with Stantec Architecture Incorporated. They are the final designer for the Depot District project. And this change order is in the amount of $238,799 for the design of the canopies for the bus parking area. And as you mentioned, we have David Osborne here, the project manager for the Depot District to answer any questions you may have. And later on in this meeting, David is actually gonna give an update on the Depot District project. So do you have any questions for David or myself? The only question I have, and I, and I know that we there were some unknowns at the time when we designed the building, and I think the canopies, you know, kind of what we were doing. Did we always anticipate this change order or did something um, change in what we, how we looked at it that, created the need for the change order? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so we always did anticipate at least a portion of this change order. The other item that uh, is involved in this change order is design of the, the charging equipment infrastructure for the battery electric buses, which will be housed underneath uh, two of the four canopies. And so that we always knew that we were gonna have. Um, Initially, the designers were planning on uh, using a, a previous design that had been used on other uh, UTA projects and just copying that design. And as we got into the looking into the bus charging uh, equipment and other things, there'll be some of that that will be housed within the canopies. Um, and so the, the other design that they were looking at copying was basically only had the structural capability to hold itself up. And so when we start looking at mounting equipment and other things and potentially solar panels on those canopies, they just needed to be a, a little bit stronger. And so this is, uh, that was the purpose of this change order for the, the bus charging equipment and then to design those canopies to be able to have those additional capabilities. Thanks, David. That really uh, answered my question. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Just a quick question, because um, I know we had had the discussion about solar panels i think uh even when uh, carlton and i first started and so um so but that was never actually part of the the um structural work as was um bid out is that is that correct i'm just that's what i'm just hearing you say yeah that's correct okay 
Thanks. Any other questions? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion on or, uh, on the change order. And Chair Christensen, I'll make the motion to for the change order for the depot district final design uh, with Stantec Architecture Incorporated. Second. I have a motion from Jeff, seconded by Beth, to approve the change order. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes. Uh, thanks, Dave, and thanks, Mary, on that one. Uh, that brings us to item D, which is the change order for on-call infrastructure maintenance task order number 18 on 4800 West on the Mid-Jordan Line for the embedded grade crossing with Stacy and Whitback. With that, we welcome Mary DeLoretto as well as Dave Hancock. Mary? Yeah, this is a change order with our on-call maintenance um, contractor, Stacy Whitback. It's for another grade crossing. I believe this is the fifth one we brought to you this year. Um, this one will be at 4,800 West along the Mid-Jordan line. And it's in the amount of $325,833. And I have David, uh, Dave Hancock here to answer any specific questions you have. I believe this work will be scheduled to be performed this month. So any questions for David, Dave or myself? The only question for Dave, are you able to get your concrete? <laughs> you know, uh, so far, so far we have been able to. And so uh, this, this one is planned on Memorial Day weekend. So, so we'll, we'll see, we're, we're in the process of scheduling, scheduling that already. So okay. I think, I think we'll be okay. After personally recently going through an experience, I'm like, I'm really impressed with whatever you get. <laughs> Good yeah. luck with that. So it's anyway. difficult. Yeah, I'm sure. And unusual times. Uh, any other questions? None. I would entertain a motion on this change order. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the change order for the on-call infrastructure maintenance task order number 18 for 4800 West Mid Jordan Line, the embedded grade crossing with Stacy and Whitbeck. I'll second that. I have a motion from Beth, seconded by Jeff, on the approval of the change order. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes. Thanks, Mary, and thanks, Dave, on that item. I think with that, if I'm, as long as I'm following the agenda correctly, that brings us to service and fair approvals. And uh, with that, um, we welcome Kenzie Kunkel, who's going to. Uh, speak to us on a past purchase administration agreement number two with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Kenzie. Thank you, trustees, and good morning. So first off, thank you for allowing me time this morning to present. Um, I'm going to present two FAIR requests for your approval. I'll start first with the FAIR approval for Amendment 2 to the Custom Past Purchase and Administration Agreement with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Last September, the Board of Trustees authorized UTA to enter into a 14-month custom pass purchase and administration agreement with the church. And the value of that contract was $2.1 million, um, with payments due in two installments. So due to the continued impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, most of, church, most of the church employees have not returned back to the office and are not utilizing their transit pass. So subsequently, the church has requested and staff recommends that payment terms for installment two of the church's contract be based on an actual use of the UTA system, uh, less a 17.5% discount. And this would replace the negotiated bulk pass rate. Uh, the discount of 17.5% is in line with other organizations participating in a paper trip agreement that are similar in size and ridership to the church. So UTA and the church will continue to reevaluate the need to continue their paper trip billing or to reactivate the church's fixed contract on a quarterly basis or as needed throughout the remainder of the year. Uh, if the church remains on a paper trip agreement through the end of 2021, it is estimated that the new contract amount for 2021 will be 223,000 and will replace the fixed amount of 2.1 million. 
So if there are not any further questions, I would like to request board approval of amendment two to the custom pass purchase and agreement uh, with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and authorize the executive director to execute this agreement. Any questions for Kenzie on this item? Just one quick question. I just, um, I'm assuming that there would be um, uh, movement or capability to make adjustments as necessary. Um, I know we don't know how things are actually going to, to come forward um, post pandemic. And so I'm just curious if there's some flexibility or some ability to, to go in and, and make changes as necessary. That is something that we are seeking um, to be able to do within this amendment. It does, you know, allow us to move back to that fixed contract as needed. Um, and basically it just says, we'll relook at it and negotiate it as needed. Perfect, thank you. Kenzie, does this amendment go back to the beginning of the contract or is it from this point going forward, you know? It would be from January 1st. January 1st. Moving forward. Okay. All right. Um, any questions? So? No, Chair, I'm ready to make a uh, motion to, uh, to approve the fair agreement, the past purchase and administration agreement, Amendment 2 with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. Second. I have a motion from Jeff, uh, seconded by Beth. Uh, to approve the amendment to their fair agreement. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion passes. Thank you. And then, Kenzie, uh, a youth writer's license. That, uh, yeah, it sounds like an adventurous experience. <laughs> Always. every Everything in fairs is adventurous. Uh, all right. So the second fair item that I'll be brief be presenting today is a promotional fair request for the 2021 youth rider's license. So the rider's license gives youth ages 18 and under access to a premium transit pass for the period of June 1st through August 31st for only $49 and UTA has offered this pass each summer since 2014. Youth have been identified by the ridership task force as a target market to assist with bringing riders back to UTA during the COVID-19 recovery and to cultivate future transit riders. Staff recommends continuing to offer the rider's license pass at the price point of $49 in 2021. And it is estimated that the revenue received for rider's license pass sales in 2021 will be between 86 to $171,000. And this is estimated based on 2019 pass sales and assumes that 2021 sales will be between 40 to 80% of the total rider's license passes that sold in 2019. So once again, if there are any further questions, I would like to request board approval of the promotional fare request for the 2021 youth rider's license at the price point of $49. Can do that. First of all, it's a great program and, and at some point it would make sense to somehow integrate it into our normal fare um, program and, and um, you know, I think it's something we want to kind of perpetuate and encourage, you know, through the high schools or, you know, through appropriate avenues. The one question that hit me uh, when I was looking at it the other day is uh, what do you do? Uh, and it's not an um, uh, overall, it's not a, a um, high amount. It's a great value. But if you're a uh, youth coming from a low income family, uh, coming up with 49 bucks may be a little bit challenging. And I just wondered whether or not there's a thought about, could you pay for it over time? Could you, you know, when we look at low income fares uh, in a family qualifies, could a youth uh, get that or would the low income fare pass be lower than this? I, I don't know. I just um, thought to myself, I didn't want to sort of disadvantage a, a, a teenager coming from a low income family if there's a way to, I wouldn't want to hold this up. I just uh, maybe uh, when if when we deal with the low income fair thing, uh, to just think about that. I don't, and maybe you've given it thought and this is the only pragmatic way to do it. But. 
No, I think that's a great point and something that we definitely can consider as we're looking into some new low income initiatives. So I'll definitely keep that top of mind. Yeah. And and maybe it's not an issue for some of these families, but I just think, especially if they're on a pretty low uh, wage thing, it's probably a little high to come up with between paychecks and stuff. So, um, Questions though on the proposal at hand? Yeah. I don't have any any questions. Need a motion? Yep, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the promotional fare request for the youth riders license. I'll second that and I appreciate the clarity because when I saw a youth rider's license, I thought, are they going to get to drive the buses? <laughs> <laughs> Just anyway, trying to be lighthearted here. All right. I love it. <clears throat> so I have a motion from uh, Beth seconded by Jeff. Um, and uh, for clarifications, they don't get to drive the buses. <laughs> <laughs> um, all in favor, uh, uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Uh, Kenzie, thank you. For your thank time. you. Uh, we'll next go to our first discussion item up, which is an uh, amendment for the uh, number one to the authority's 2021 budget. With that, we welcome back Bill Green and, and Mary Deloretto. Bill? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Trustees Asterson and Holbrook are back here again to discuss a, uh, uh, I'll be outlining the financial information related to this discussion item and Mary DeLoretto will be taking us through the details of the project changes outlined in this proposal. Um, in accordance with the Board of Trustees Policy 2.1 Financial Management, the Board of Trustees may amend or supplement the budget at any time after its adoption. A resolution is required for a budget amendment. So I'm here to this morning to present a proposal amending the 2021 capital budget and provide an opportunity for discussion and answer any questions you may have with our proposal. With your approval today, we would take the supplemental budget proposal to the local advisory council committee meeting on June the 2nd. Uh, following consultation with the advisory council, we would finalize this proposal and bring it back to the board for consideration and action at your June 23rd meeting. In your packet, we outlined a proposal for a $4.7 million amendment to the capital budget, which includes basically two categories of requests. Increases to the project budgets of about $4 million, if existing budgets that is, funding for six capital projects that are in our approved budget. Um, we would be using a, a variety of sources of funding I'll get to in a moment to fund those. And then we have a second category of about $750,000 for two new capital projects uh, that have been funded through state appropriations and grant requests. Since we submitted the packet to you, a uh, third category of projects has been identified and Mary will discuss, and that is a, a box elder right away preservation project that we would accelerate funding from the out years of our financial plan from 2022, uh, about $2.7 million. Uh, Mary will give you the details on that. Um, and the materials that we have uh, detailing our supplemental proposal, $4.7 million, now with the addition of Box Elder, it's about $7.4 million. And again, the source of funding for these requests is a combination of positive carry forward, that is projects in 2020 uh, that were completed uh, and the funding was not needed, uh, offset by some projects that were slightly over. There was about a $250 million positive carry forward. Uh, fund balance, um, state appropriations granted by the 2021 legislature, and again, for the new project, dedicated sales tax revenues in Box Elder. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it off to Mary, unless there's any questions for me on the financial side, and Mary will give you the details of our request. Thank you, Bill. Um, can I have, I believe we have one slide showing the table of all the projects. There we go. Thank you. So the three categories Bill mentioned. The first was increases to existing project budgets, and those are the first six projects on this table here. The front runner forward project, as you know, the legislature appropriated a significant amount of funding this year to get front runner forward moving. We had a budget of two and a half million, and now we, now we would like to increase that by another two and a half million for $5 million to really make a lot of progress on our um, 
operations modeling, as we talked about earlier today, as well as our strategic business plan and implementation plan. So we want to increase that and those funds will come from that state appropriation. The, the second project we want to increase funding is for building remodeling and reconfiguration. We have a budget of 100,000 there, and that usually gets used for different items that need to be completed. We recently went through and did an evaluation of all our restrooms, breaks rooms, um, kitchen areas in our different operating facilities. And a lot of them are in pretty poor shape, haven't been upgraded in a while. We have older buildings. I mean, the, the, uh, the facility folks do the best they can, but sometimes you just have to replace parts and do things. So we want to slowly start improving those facilities. And this year we'd like to improve the, the Meadowbrook facilities, the break room. Let's see, we wanna do make improvements to the men's and women's locker rooms and restrooms and upgrade. A, we have a first aid room that we want to turn into a unisex restroom there. And that would be another 365,000 we'd need for that work. Um, we also have the safety folks. They do inspections routinely and look for things that need to be improved. And they've identified about $77,000 worth of items that they would like to add to the safety, general safety project budget. They include things like fixing the floor in the Jordan River Service Center parts room that buckled due to the earthquake last year. They want to update the battery rooms in at the Jordan River and Midvale um, facilities to extend the sprinkler systems and open the widen the doors to accommodate pallets so they could easily move the batteries in and out. They want to do power upgrades. Right now we have an electric cable running across a truck shop at Jordan River Service Center to a hot zone, and they want to be able to upgrade the power so they you don't have that cable on the floor. And then also installing a fall arrest system at the Warm Springs facilities. So that those are what adds up to that 77,000. They've also identified some additional areas where they need corridor fencing. We have a budget of 50,000, but the operators have, our, our bus operators have identified different areas where they have concerns and would like to see additional um, fencing put in near our um, track stations when they pull in there. So that's what that 50,000 is for. Um, on our non-revenue service vehicles, we have a budget this year of 1.5 million, which is a lot, but in the past we have severely underfunded that budget. And so we're just playing catch up. So we think we've identified the, the operations units have identified another 480,000 worth of vehicles that we need. This is for built vehicles that have just getting older and, and scary to use, you know, just we, we have our folks driving all around. We don't want them breaking down. And also special equipment, also increased, you know, additional employees will need additional vehicles for. So with this, we think we'll be at a good place. And as we move forward, as long as we maintain about 500,000 a year on those new revenue service vehicles will be good going forward. Um, so the last one of the existing projects is the capital contingency. We started the year with a $2 million budget in capital contingency, and we had to use about 429,000 of that for our front room paint booth project. If you recall, we came to you earlier this year for that transfer of funds, and we would like to replenish that capital contingency uh, back up to the $2 million budget that was in there. Um, those are the existing projects do you want me to stop if you have any questions on those or should i keep going mary i do have a couple questions but beth it looked like you might have had a question i do thank you mr chair um on the non-rev service vehicles um are we looking at um when we look at those fleet vehicles are they going to be looked at in terms of uh, some type of like either electric vehicles or some other um, propulsion or is it just strictly diesel and have we made that decision yet? Um, I don't know if the decision has been made on all of them. We, I believe we typically have gas and, and diesel on those. Uh, Eddie, I see you turn on. Do you have anything to add on that or? 
Yeah, just a little bit. So, trustees, we're talking about normal cars and uh, SUVs here that our super that our operation supervisors drive around, um, you know, in the system. And so, right now, we would be looking at you know regular gasoline vehicles is what we budgeted for. Thanks. Uh, first of all, I, I commend you uh, for looking at the operators facilities. Um, you know that. Um, you know, it's time <laughs> as we've taken some tours, you know, and I, they, um, and you got to kind of whittle away at those, um, as, you, as quickly as you can. Uh, the one question I have, and it's not a, a discouragement for looking at non revenue service vehicles, is I was on a call yesterday, and uh, the one gentleman in the call uh, was with a car rental agency, and talked about the challenge of actually finding new fleet vehicles. And, um, you know, it's tied to a chip shortage, but I, uh, and I, real, thankfully we're, we're probably not having to replace them, but I, the availability timeline that he was outlining for their company was, it was longer than I would have thought. Um, and so just the availability, maybe our, our fleet options put us in line a little, Sooner, but um, you know, just something to expect. And then, then it wasn't very cheap. I mm -hmm. talking to a friend who was trying to buy a used car, and it just went up like fifteen hundred dollars in a week or two. Uh, so we've seen some kind of crazy. I think they're just cyclical in the nature of the current demand. But uh, it's an interesting uh, kind of environment to try to be securing vehicles. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, any other questions on those projects so far? Okay, so the the next category that Bill mentioned was the um, acceleration of 2022 budget authority. So for Box Elder right of way preservation, the budget this year is a million dollars. Uh, next year it is four million dollars. If you look at the five year capital plan, we would like to move 2.7 of that forward. We have been working with UDOT for a while to um, purchase what they call the Utah-Idaho Central Railroad Corridor or the UIC Corridor. And we are now finally ready to make that purchase. And it's been appraised for $2.7 million. So we want to add that $2.7 million so we can accelerate that purchase and buy it this year rather than waiting until next year. Um, these are all funded by Box Elder second quarter sales tax. So we have the funds available currently and we were just planning on using them next year, but know that we can now use them this year. Any questions on that one? Just a quick comment. I know that uh, the discussions that we've been having with Box Elder, that, um, that this will be really something that they are looking forward to. Um, I know that land is going up there hugely, like leaps and bounds, just like everywhere else. And so I think it's um, smart for us to just um, borrow against the 2022 and do this simply because it's just going to continue to increase as seems where that's going. So thank you. Okay, thanks. And then the last category are additional budget authority for two new projects. And as you can see, the S line extension that was not in our um, budget this year, or, in, or I don't believe it was in the five year capital plan, but with the state appropriations of $12 million for that project, we are happy to get started this year. We think if we add 600,000 to the project uh, as a project budget, we can make a lot of progress on alternative analysis and maybe even some conceptual design for that project. And the last one is the 5600 West project. We do not currently have grants for that, but we have submitted a TTIP grant application for that. And we are also going to try, um, we think we are gonna go after the raise grant for federal funds for that to match each other. And if we get those grants, then we wanna be able to start work on that project. So this budget is, will only happen if we get um, those grant awards and we could start doing that work on those projects. So any questions on any of this? I mean, the only question I have, um, do you, what the 600,000 versus 12 million on the budget, uh, is it, 
uh, I assume we have to sort of draw it down uh, as we use it, or does the state give us $12 million? And, and then how do we sort of budget for that $12 million? So the $12 million, I believe, was from bonding. And so we would have to, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the 12 million was bonding. And how that works is they, the state only wants to um, bond once or twice for our projects. So we want to figure out our schedule of when our needs are and then put those bond um, requests together. We will get reimbursed for those bonds if we expend them before we receive the bonds. Okay. As far as the front runner forward one, we plan to use the state appropriation, which is $100 million was the one time fund. We would use that before we use the bond funds and those will be distributed a quarter. Every quarter we will get one fourth of that 100 million. So that's how those work. And so my, I guess I didn't know whether we're sort of advancing funds here or what, like will we get a quarter of the 100 million in, in we will like be July? We will be advancing funds on the S line because we will not be taking the bond out this year. However, for the front runner forward, we will be um, receiving the money before we've expended it. We'll get the first quarter of that in September, I was told. Oh, okay. I did, I did, the only question I was wondering is, do we need to have that number in our budget amendment? The full amount, I, Bill, I'll turn that over so, to you. So, Mr. Chair, just to clarify, are you, I think what you're suggesting is that, that we shouldn't be showing it as a state appropriation at this time, we should be showing it as local. For no, 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 I, I'm totally fine of the source. I just wondered whether we should be, uh, uh, budgeting a quarter of the 100 million or whatever we would get in September should should we be budgeting that I guess is my question or do we just receive the funds and since there's no budget it just basically sits in our cash reserves the latter it, we it's on the revenue side so what we'll be doing um and if I could just give you a quick update I think if you don't mind I, I think Mary and her staff have done a really good job the first step that they've done is they've calculated the carry forward and we had a discussion about that and then they've done a really nice job of actually looking at the cash flow of all the projects and we'll be reporting to you on that in our May 26 meeting but that that's partially where some of this fund balance is coming from as we take the budget authority and look what we can really deliver um, so there's okay. some of that and then what we'll do is we'll roll all that together with uh, the new requests that we have, some of the new money once we get to a better handle on our program and project delivery uh, schedules for next year and beyond. And then that'll all be rolled into the 22 budget requests, which we'll bring to you in the summer. Okay. All right. Sounds great. Thank you for that clarification. Any other questions on this budget amendment? Now, my understanding is at, at this point, if we're, if we're good, this will go to the local advisory council for their um, recommendation and and approval um, and then back to us. Correct. Okay. Uh, any concerns from the trustees about it going forward in this form? No, Mr. Chair, I'm good with that. Thanks. No, I'm good as well. Thank you. All right. Great. Uh, anything else, Bill or Mary? I, I just a minor technical. I think you bring up a very good point, Chair Christensen, and that is. The S line extension for purposes of showing on this budget, we should probably show it as local, and then we'll show the reimbursement next year. Okay. Yeah. However, works best. I realize ultimately the money's coming from the state, and certainly don't have any problems advancing it. So, yeah. Thanks, Bill and Mary. That's great. Uh, we'll go to uh, item B, which is the UTA on demand uh, microtransit late night summer service pilot with. Uh, Jaron Robertson. Jaron. Uh, good morning, trustees. I'm quite excited to be here today to talk about a UTA late night uh, service microtransit pilot with UTA on demand by VIA um, in the Salt Lake City region to support UTA ridership recovery efforts. Uh, if you wouldn't mind advancing to the next slide. Um, really, the purpose of this, this pilot is to track and retain new ridership. Uh, we want to support COVID-19 uh, revitalization efforts and recovery phase 
including providing support for stimulating the economy and economic development. Uh, we want to provide a public transit option for late shift workers, local businesses, uh, employees, and their patrons. Um, the pilot is in alignment um, with the Downtown Alliance Summer 2020 initiatives and activities, and it really provides us an opportunity to continue to build brand recognition and awareness for UTA on demand as we continue to uh, advance microtransit type pilots as part of our five-year service plan. And finally, I just want to kind of note that, you know, as an agency, we've long been interested in understanding how late night service could work um, as alternative to traditional um, bus service. Um, so this really provides an opportunity to learn a lot for, about demand, cost, and then make uh, decisions as an agency if this is, might be a better alternative as part of future planning efforts. And then going to the next slide. Uh, really, the concept for this pilot is, is to provide, again, a late night summer microtransit service using UT on demand. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to utilize existing idle resources from the current pilot. Um, our current service in, in South Salt Lake County um, runs from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. And so essentially we can take these resources um, when they're not in use and put them in back into use um, at late nights um, as part of this, this pilot. Um, the idea is to provide the service within the Salt Lake City area. Um, this would be the full city essentially excluding the airport. Much like our current service, um, we would provide connections to transit services while they're in operations, but also provide interzonal transit service during all operating hours. Uh, this is a pretty short term pilot. Again, it's intended to run with summer in alliance or in in uh, in alignment with the downtown alliance summer initiatives. So we'd begin Memorial Day weekend and end on Labor Day weekend. Um, again, in alignment with those initiatives, we provide service only on Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday nights, and this would be from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, this is just uh, an overview of what the service area would look like. Um, much like in the south end of the valley, we would geofence uh, a zone in, in, in Salt Lake City proper, and so that, um, again, just same parameters that our customers have access to the service, um, when during our normal operating hours. And so just as an overview of what, what the service area would look like. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a great opportunity as well for us to work with our partners here in the community. And so we are working with the Downtown Alliance, um, as I've noted, and we're also working with Salt Lake City um, to, to operate this pilot. Um, of course, this is a public-private partnership um, with VIA, um, as we're doing in the south end of the valley. Um, talking about our operating expenses, um, our, our estimated operations cost, which is a direct um, link to what it costs for us to run the service, is about $120,000. Um, I do want to note that, you know, this is a higher operating cost than we typically see with microtransit services. Um, and this is mostly due to the late night hours and um, uh, it's just more expensive to acquire or to acquire drivers um, to manage a project. Um, overnight than it is during the day. Um, we do have some deadhead time associated with the service too, because we're currently um, using these these vehicles that are running in the south end of the valley, um, and then just weekend operations too. So we do see a higher operating cost, but really what this does, it provides an opportunity for to really, again, evaluate late night service and how we can develop various business models in the future um, based on the data acquired, which we might be more cost effective moving going forward in the future. Um, I would recommend a project contingency of about $50,000 to note that, you know, we've done some estimated ridership and um, with, with COVID-19 just, you know, on the brink of us kind of emerging from it, it there's just so much that's unknown. And so from one aspect of the pilot, we might see little ridership, but on the other aspect, we see far more ridership than we ever anticipated. So we really want to leave a little bit of flexibility um, within that um, that budget for us to adapt and change if necessary. But again, we do um, really think we can run the, the service for about $120,000. Uh, I want to note that, you know, the first quarter of our microtransit service um, was, was under budget quite a bit. We've had these discussions and, and our ability to really dynamically adjust and adapt the service um, in response to the ridership um, in the south end of the valley. And so we already hold um, a not an agreed upon not to exceed budget with VIA for this year. Um, given the fact that we're under budget, as it was mentioned, we have no need to go above and beyond what we've already, already agreed upon with VIA on that not to exceed amount. And then we can already fund that um, using the current microtransit budget um, as we're under budget this first quarter as noted. So no additional funds are being asked for and we're not looking to 
um, extend or, or, or sorry, expand upon what we already agreed upon via for this year's um, operating budget. Um, one of the most important aspects of this pilot is really our marketing and communication efforts. Um, I've noted about a twenty-five to fifty thousand dollar budget. I think that is probably pretty high, actually. Um, we're working with uh, our marketing and communications team to really finalize and, and develop these marketing strategies. But uh, fortunately, we, we have funding in, in both the marketing and budget, and we are working with our partners um, with Wasalik City and the Downtown Alliance to really support these marketing and communications efforts. So they're just probably not going to be, uh, or at least hopefully not as uh, much of a uh, uh, cost as, as we've noted here as, as we work with our partners. And so with that, I think the next slide, I, I think that's all I have. So I'm um, ready to, oh, that was my last slide, sorry. Uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. Jaren, the, the one question uh, that actually got posed to me in my own Facebook uh, account back when we started the South Valley, it was from, a, you know, I think a Lyft or an Uber driver is, are, are you competing with me? And uh, there it was a little easier to argue you were. I guess the question I have is how do you respond to that? And, and uh, uh, just because it's such, there are such odd hours in a, in a time zone where that's probably who they would be calling to get a ride back home or back, you know, to wherever. I, I can see some late night workers, you know, or, you know, graveyard or workers that are, you know, trying to get home and that might, might work, you know, like at the hospital and live in, in the downtown area. Um, and I could see a plus there. Um, but anyway, I just wondered what, how, how you're going to, how we would respond to that. Sure. And, and trustee, it's a great question. You know, first and foremost, this is a public private partnership. So we are working with the private sector to provide service to the, to the community in hours, which, you know, traditionally we, we, it doesn't make sense for UTA to run bus service because of the ridership demand or it's very costly and it's very hard as we've talked about these type of services um, to provide ample coverage um, with one type of mode or route. And so first and foremost, you know, using these new technologies and, and, and microtransit is a covered based solution to really test transit service. And as, as we've talked about in the past, you know, the way we've designed just this microtransit service is really to be another mode of public transit. And so there are a lot of um, elements to the service that aren't traditionally the same um, when you look at what, what Lyft and Uber are providing. Um, you know, we, we put we put accessible vehicles out there. Uh, we don't necessarily go door to door, uh, we require shared rides. Um, and again, we, we are working with the private sector. I also think that um, um, we, we can note that, um, oh, I, I'm sorry, Trustee, I lost my train of thought. I had one more point to bring up on that, um, um, but I'll, I'll come back to it if I, if I recall. Sure, that's fine. Oh, Beth, it looks like you might have a question. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jaron, I, I had a more broad question than what Trustee Christensen asked, and and mostly it was I'm just what is the goal? I guess what what are we trying to kind of capture, or um, is this just an overall continued visibility, or could you maybe articulate what kind of the goal is on this? Yeah, I mean, really, I mean, it's, ridership is not just the goal on this one. We're really looking at how do we attract and retain new ridership for the agency. Um, again, we don't have a lot of options when it comes to late night transit service. And we know, and trustee, I think this leads to my last question I was going to mention, um, you know, the, the whole um, west side um, where we see a lot of industrial um, employment centers and late night workers who traditionally don't have uh, opportunities to use transit and trying to understand, is there a demand for these type hours? And so really it's a learning opportunity for to see, are we missing out um, or, or do we have gaps in service that, that we can't provide now that we actually have demand for? And do we need to uh, consider this and plan for as part of future efforts when it comes to transit service? Um, again, we wanna support um, um, a revitalization effort um, as part of COVID-19, help people with new mobility options when it comes to um, using uh, or, or having mobility options. And, you know, and, and, you know one thing is, is more mobility options are generally better than limited. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, the 
providing the community with with multiple options is, is is the best solution there is. And so working, you know, whether it's public transit, whether it is the private sector, um, mobility is just so critical. Um, you know, when it, when it comes to uh, access to opportunity, when it comes to disabled community, when it comes to um, economic development, it's just it's more options. And so we just don't know as an agency what that demand might look like late at night. Um, and it just provides that opportunity again for us to get a better sense. And we may determine that there's no demand and that this is something that we may not want to move forward with, but we may see that there is an untapped market, right? Looking for public transit options and that we may want to consider this as part of future planning efforts. I appreciate that, Jaron. And, and I did, um, when you mentioned the, um, the you know, the uh, ADA or the, um, if there's some type of disability and that access to those individuals, that does bring up that, that um, kind of articulates how these vehicles are different um, than the traditional private sector Uber and Lyft type of, of models. And that is that they have access to vehicles that have ADA comp um, compliance. Um, so thank you, I appreciate that. I I think it's it's helpful to understand what the overall goal is, to, to understand how we're going to capture that or potentially within um, a certain, as you say, geofenced location. And, and I think Salt Lake City is probably a good way to test some of that transit connectivity pieces um, during these late night hours. So I'm hopeful that, that you know, if we can take that, we can maybe translate that into potentially other areas as well to see where that we have gaps. So thank you. Absolutely. You know, this is a discussion only item, uh, but other questions on this? Okay. Jaren, the only other one, and I, and I totally understand Stand and remember from my airport days um, why you can't go on airport property. The, the one sort of thing out there, though, that was always a one I couldn't really respond to very well was uh, if somebody with a disability comes in on a late night flight, you know, that's beyond the hours of uh, tracks. You know, how do they get to their hotel? And and I I, I don't know that that's on us to solve, but I. I I've, somewhere in there that you know if the airport unless the private providers have the ability to do that it's something we ought to think about anyway uh, that's one that was hard to really respond to in a positive way trustee i would agree and i think that as we um you know we go through this pilot and we learn from it and we, we get real data that helps us um, with future planning efforts we can think about how the airport um, could or could not be part of a future service if that were uh, something we would decide to pursue in the future. Yeah. Um, recognizing we have left that out um, um, is it would be quite costly and challenging to serve as part of this pilot. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, uh, keep us informed on how it goes and and um, appreciate that update, so. Thank you, we will uh, absolutely do. We'll move on to item D, which is Ogden on board uh, station, oh, excuse me, item C, Salt Lake Central Station Area Plan uh, Addendum. Um, with that, we welcome Paul Drake and Jordan Swain. Paul. All right, thank you, trustees. Um, we uh, actually have two agenda items that uh, you almost got into the second one, but they are associated because they're all under one resolution that we intend to present to the local advisory council next month. Um, they include some planning efforts um, that amend and augment some, some previous efforts, the other the uh, previous station area plans done for Salt Lake Central and, and Ogden Central stations. Um, and as you know, uh, the state statute and, and UTA policy require that these plans are reviewed and approved by the local advisory council and then adopted um, by, the, by the board of trustees. So with that, I'm gonna turn the time to Jordan Swain, our TOD project manager. Uh, yes, thank you, Paul, and thank you, trustees. We're excited to, to be here um, to present these two, these two uh, modifications to uh, plans that we're very excited about. I wanna clarify that both of these plans um, are for station areas that, we, that are at the forefront of our efforts in the TOD program, um, and that we'll, we'll likely have a, an RFP in the near future, so. Um, both of these are, are in preparation for that. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide and jump into the Salt Lake Central addendum. 
Uh, just a, a bit of background. Uh, the, the original uh, Salt Lake Central Station Area Plan was initiated in 2018. It was a, a collaborative effort between UTA and the Salt Lake City RDA. Uh, both both uh, entities control property within the station area, so um, we decided it would be uh, fruitful and beneficial if we uh, collaborated on a plan. Uh, the, the original plan uh, involved really a, a great amount of uh, community engagement. UDA, who is the uh, uh, consultant, they they have a, a wonderful community engagement process, and so we were able to take advantage of that. And I think the the outcome was very um, uh, was was was, was uh, superior because of that than, than many other stationary plans. Um, and uh, and then so so the ultimate outcome was a, a cohesive vision for the plan area. Uh, that, that described how the RDA and Salt Lake City could collaborate, not just on the plan, but the implementation of the plan as well. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, the purpose of the addendum and the reason this is an addendum and not an amendment is because we are simply adding information to the original plan. We're not changing anything in the Salt Lake Central plan, but rather um, we're responding to uh, recent changes in the market and uh, some some recent changes in the RDA's plan for uh, their own redevelopment, which is uh, directly east of our of our project area. Uh, so that graphic shows in a very messy way uh, all of the moving parts here. Um, oh, and one other moving part is the uh, the future UTA Clean Fuel Center, which is uh, currently under construction. Um, so so. Uh, so the, the the main purpose of this addendum then is to is to create a, or to add the western parcels to the overall vision, so UTA can understand how it could possibly participate uh, in the development of those pos of those parcels, and then also how we can modify some of our transit critical infrastructure, namely the bus the bus loop, uh, so that it it's it's uh, compatible with the Festival Street and other things that are uh, contained in the RDA development. Um, and then with uh, with uh, all stationary plans, we, we wanted to to do this prior to an RFP so the UTA is able to uh, render its expectations to the development community and receive um, responses from the development community for the ultimate redevelopment of the uh, of the area. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, the, the addendum, uh, uh, so so we worked with uh, Urban Design Associates, again, the same consultant who, who completed the initial plan, um, and they provided two scenarios for the development of the Western parcels. Uh, this is the first concept or scenario, and um, and the main, the main premise here is that it respects the current uh, parcel configuration. So the rights of way that are being added um, and the land use is conformed to the, the current parcel configuration. Um, we all know uh, land assemblage can come with a lot of variables. And so um, we wanted to uh, understand how it could be developed if you know certain parties were not willing to dispose of certain properties and if UTA were just to proceed with the development of its property or the property it controls. So in this scenario, we um, there's an emphasis on office use uh, or an office land use. And so we were able to get about 400,000 square feet of office space um, just in, in property that UTA controls right now. Um, and then outside of uh, or on properties that UTA does not control, um, it would be possible to get about 400 residential units and almost 7,000 square feet of retail. Um, uh, the, and, and then of course, there's, a, there's quite a large uh, parking requirement uh, because the the parking structure that's depicted here will also contain stalls for park and ride facilities. Uh, so now on to concept two, which is the next slide. Uh, concept two uh, assumes or takes as a presupposition that we we can um, assemble a, a larger parcel and create a uh, a new right of way. That allow that really opens up a lot more space for residential development to the west. Um, because of that, um, the the amount of office space is diminished. Um, but there are certain there are certain benefits to this. I think the accessibility in the scenario or concept two is advantageous for pedestrians and bicyclists and so forth. 
and provides a more intuitive uh, connection to the station. Uh, so you can see that the, the residential units are increasing to 770 units in this scenario. Um, and so that's that's something to consider. And then on to the next slide, uh, UDA, um, as always, they're thinking far into the future and they provided some information uh, in this addendum for a possible um, opportunity to create a podium over UTA's bus parking area, uh, upon which further development could be constructed. So uh, this, this dashed rectangle here represents an opportunity for, for more vertical construction uh, or vertical development over UTA's uh, uh, bus parking area. But like I said, that, that, that scenario would not currently be economically feasible as something that may be feasible far in the future. Uh, and then lastly, the next slide uh, depicts uh, a concept for how we may reconfigure the, the bus loop in order to uh, maximize the efficiency of our bus routing and also um, open up uh, almost two acres uh, of property for further redevelopment. So you can see on this in this diagram, buses are entering the bus loop from uh, second south, um, which is which is on the right there. Uh, there's then a, a just a, a linear array of saw teeth, um, a shared boarding and a lighting area to the south, and then buses exit the bus loop onto sixth west uh, using a, um, a prioritized signal across the tracks and then um, are back um, in the right of way. So uh, we, you know, to, to come up with this concept, we worked closely with our um, service planning group, Barry Calson and Joy Elsop, uh, and and many other folks at UTA, found that this could really um, improve the efficiency of our routing quite a bit. Uh, so I think the the cost benefit of of reconfiguring the bus route using this concept uh, would be would be beneficial. So, so that's those are the contents of the addendum. Um, I think the next slide is a question slide. So, oh, Jordan, I, I do have a question, and and um, and it's probably back on the earlier concepts. And uh, and I realize, you know, unless we partner with somebody and go through a condemnation process and stuff. Um, uh, you know, we don't necessarily have rights to the, some of the lands that you were showing in your development. The flip side to it is, is you're not likely to find, uh, uh, develop, you know, usable land for actual bus facilities in the downtown area again. And are, are we, you know, for the sort of short time uh, income from the development of those sites, are you really shooting yourself in the foot? Uh, you know, we just got done with a construction update uh, on uh, during redesign of the uh, bus coverings. You know, so the notion of throwing a, something in there, I realize it's in the future, but you're also sending a message that it's a desired outcome. And, I, and I'm questioning whether or not it's really a desired outcome. Uh, uh, Chair Christian, are, are you for referring specifically to that podium? Uh, oh, rendering? All, all three of them, really, uh, because, um, you know, if you're, you're going to, uh, uh, you know, if, right now, you know, we, we can't add any bus service uh, and we don't know where, you know, 5600 West Express buses are going to need to park. And, and there's a lot of questions. Um, about where uh, new bus facilities could be. So this is the one area where you could actually have them and have you know reasonable access to the freeways and other Definitely. places. And so, you know, I understand the desire to add development there, but why would you sort of pin yourself in on this potential future of, uh, you know, bus service expansion space? Yeah, so I think uh, that's a, I mean, that's a great observation um, and something that we have, uh, Paul and I have definitely considered and discussed. I think one of the advantages of visioning the space early is uh, opening up the possibility to collaborate with a private developer so that we can preserve the, the necessary capacity for 
um, our bus storage and operations and so forth. Um, so I think that's really the advantage to the first the first concept that we showed. I, I guess how did they preserve it? That's what I'd like to understand. Yeah. So um, I mean, if if actually if we can go back to that first concept, uh, that would be and, helpful. And I apologize because we're on a short time frame, but, right. uh, oh. but this is an important thing, and we may not be able to do it here in this meeting. But but yeah. So ahead. with uh, yeah, so just really quickly, I mean, with the with the current construction, I think that we have uh, the necessary capacity to to house or store our buses in the near term, but we we do understand that some expansion is going to be necessary uh, for us to to operate the way we want to from Salt Lake Central. So so this scenario where um, these these gray hatched bays are are. Um, possible areas that w where UTA could expand its bus storage. And then that could also even grow into what is depicted as the residential E here. So, so I think, you know, this, this concept one does show that you, it, there is development potential and that UTA could collaborate with a private developer or even proceed on its own while still preserving the necessary storage that it needs for, for future operations of Salt Lake Central. Mr. Chair, I think I think you are getting at the kind of the intent of this whole uh, addendum. And there's a there is a lot of development pressure in this area, as you're as you're aware, and we're and we're cognizant that uh, that you know UTA has transit critical needs in this area as well, and so that's kind of the purpose of doing this is so that we could see if there is a possibility of marrying the two um, to meet UTA's current and future transportation needs. But also meet kind of those long-term uh, long-term objectives of the city for economic development, um, and these kind of show what what is potential with uh, trying trying again to to marry those two uses. So this does meet what we project um, for the storage capacity for for buses, but also uh, looks at after after meeting those objectives, what is what is the potential? What is the remaining potential? I mean, maybe it's just me, but I can't imagine wanting to live, you know, across the road from a bus facility that starts at 3.30 in the morning, uh, driving around, at, which they have to do. Um, so I just, I guess I question how viable residential is in this corridor. I would say that um, it's an opportunity, certainly when you look at an affordable housing component to that, um, it's surprising. So gateway properties are right up abutting I-15, which has no um, no downtime, if you will. And uh, there's const there's constant movement on the freeways. And so I, I do think it's 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 smart to understand that there could be development um, options that allow flexibility for some of these components. Um, Again, I would say an affordable housing, a true affordable housing, because I know that phrase gets kind of um, nuanced, but to have that opportunity could be of value moving forward just because of the increased scarcity of land. So yeah. I just want to. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and Chair Christensen, I, I think that you've described the reason we didn't initially include this in the, in the station area plan in 2018 is because we thought you know, how could that possibly develop into anything desirable? You know, th there won't ever be an appetite. And yet over the last 18 months and two years, we've seen um, a housing market that's just out of control. And so um, there there does seem to be some appetite by the development community to, to pursue uh, residential development here. But again, I think that's an advantage of concept one is the predominant use is office, and it's not going to put people's living spaces there. Well, I guess it's just fair to say I still have reservations, but uh, I don't want to stop a, a, a process of discussion. So, um, why don't we, unless there's more questions on this one, why don't we have you go on to number two? Or the okay, next great. one, which is the uh, Ogden. Great. And then, and then so um, the Ogden on board uh, plan is a true amendment. It's uh, It's actually, uh, taking information that was uh, initially produced in a 
in a stationary plan in 2018. Uh, now this, 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 this stationary plan is slightly unique because it was part of uh, the overall Ogden BRT corridor analysis. So we thought it was a good opportunity as part of that analysis to really hone in on the Ogden Central Station and you know try to try to get to some vision um, in the process. Uh, we did so. There, there was a vision contained in Ogden on board, but it was extremely high level and kind of is difficult to really use as a as a as a plan that would you know inform us of what we need to do or what Ogden needs to do in preparation of a development. Um, and so fast forward to last year, um, uh, uh, Ogden City. Uh, initiated its own uh, planning process for its downtown area um, called Make Ogden. Uh, and that provided quite a lot of detail for the entire downtown area. However, some of the details in Make Ogden didn't necessarily correspond with the recommendations that came out of Ogden on board. And so, um, so recently, uh, Ogden contacted us and um, proposed that that we initiate an additional planning process to amend. Ogden on board so that it is um, in sync with uh, with the recommendations that came out of Make Ogden. And so that's the, uh, the main purpose of this amendment. Uh, and if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, yes, as I just said, so that this the, the the purpose of the amendment is to reconcile the differences between Ogden on board and Make Ogden. Um, one of the main uh, differences is that there are some infrastructural changes described in Make Ogden that we had not anticipated at that time. Um, one of which is the possible relocation of the front runner platform south um, to be adjacent to the Union Station uh, building. Um, I mean, I, I want to clarify that even though that's a, a um, uh, something desired by Ogden. Um, we still have yet to figure out how that will work and if it's a, if it's um, feasible. So it's not a conclusion, it's just a, a possibility. Um, and so if we can, uh, well, and, and then that last bullet, of course, is that we wanted to um, really hone in on the details of how, uh, you know, this plan could be implemented and what needs to be done right now in preparation for development to occur. So that's another thing that was added to this. And, amended some of the details in Ogden on board. Um, and if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so, so the overall station area is broken up into four uh, uh, sub areas or districts. Uh, the first of which is the Union Station campus, um, which the consultant is, is seeing as, uh, you know, the main gateway into downtown and to 25th Street. Um, uh, Ogden has some really interesting and exciting intentions with uh, the Union Station building um, that, that certainly want, we want to take advantage of uh, as, as that gateway element. Uh, the second is the Transit Plaza, and this is where UTA really shines in the station area. Um, we've got a new uh, BRT route being uh, designed and constructed as we speak, uh, or, or preparing for construction as we speak. And so we wanted to take full advantage of that in respect to the design that has already been uh, approved by the uh, FTA and so forth. And so this really builds a plaza and a space around uh, that BRT station. And then the innovation district, uh, this contains uh, some some more intense uh, land uses, mixtures of, of workspace and residential and commercial and so forth. And then to the north, there is a residential area that really um, supports the neighborhood vitality and, and activity. So those are, those are, those are the four uh, sub areas of the station area. And if we can go to the next slide. Uh, so, so within this plan, I think the most important thing is a circulation plan that describes uh, what, what needs to happen to the rights of way uh, in order to break up these, uh, the blocks within the station area and also uh, ways of, ways of, um, providing routes for pedestrians and bicycles and other uh, active transportation modes, uh, both within and adjacent to the station area. Uh, Wall Street is a, is, a, is a high capacity arterial, um, uh, high speed, uh, it's wide, it's kind of frightening. And so this, this plan provides a way to, to calm uh, Wall Street and also provides safe, safe uh, crossings for pedestrians and so forth. So there's more access into the station area. 
and then of course the, the public transportation component is, uh, is is key and that'll be further described in the next slide please yeah so um so all the infrastructural changes that are being proposed in this plan uh preserve uh the current routing um that that touches uh Ogden central um the only thing that we're really suggesting is that uh park and ride facilities be consolidated in into parking structures thereby freeing up uh, property for redevelopment and then also uh to straighten out the the, the bus bays so that it's not at the kind of an awkward angle right now it's in an awkward angle that takes up quite a lot of space so so similar to what we what we're envisioning at Salt Lake Central we want to create straight arrays of saw teeth that are uh, squared with the streets so the buses can really efficiently pull in and then pull out um, but but the routing really does stay the same it's not uh, affected and then also it's worth noting that um, I think I mentioned this earlier, but the, the BRT station that has been designed and approved by the FTA is um, consistent with this with this plan. So there's there's no changes to the BRT route. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so as I said, the implementation plan is is very important for us because Ogden they're gung ho and they are serious uh, about development here. So. Um, We've got a, a, I mean, this is a succinct version, but we have an implementation plan that shows uh, where and how uh, parking facilities can can be uh, built and constructed so that UTA can uh, shift its park and ride facilities into those structures. Um, it describes how our, our bus loop can be reconfigured and a transit plaza created, all leading up to phase four, which is the initial phase of uh, mixed use commercial and residential development. Um, and then the next slide, we won't get into all of these details, but the plan does describe uh, various tasks just to get us to phase one of the implementation plan as well. And these are, these are some of those tasks. Um, the tasks on the top of this timeline are, are uh, being taken on by UTA, and then the city of Ogden has committed to taking on the tasks on the bottom. And by the end of this, we see that it does lead to the actual uh, first phase of development. So uh, we're excited to have you know this uh, this timeline that can direct and guide um, our actions in Ogden and um, and help us understand what what types of preparatory work needs to be done there. And I believe that's it. That's the amendment there. We flew through that thing, but uh, if there are any questions, we can discuss it further. Are there any questions on the Ogden one? I don't have a question more, just a comment, but I wanted to thank you both for um, your your work in in collaborating with Ogden City on this project and on their on some of their changes. Ogden is in a very unique position in that they do have um, some some still generous what I would consider to be generous land that could be that is included in this um, framework. And as we all know, land is, is so valuable. And I think that this is a real opportunity for Ogden City to, to really enhance their downtown and kind of um, look at some of their long range visions as to, to how they can navigate this. I know that there's affordable housing components to this. I know there's other elements as well. And, and it's um, I think that it is it's it's good that Ogden City is really trying to maximize what they have because as we all know, you know, once you do it, it's, you're kind of committed. And so um, I think that this is great. And I really appreciate your inputs and your um, discussions with Ogden and helping them to kind of look at this um, from multiple perspectives. So thanks, you guys, both of you. Thank you, Beth. And I just want to say that Ogden has been absolutely phenomenal to work with, and we're excited to continue our working relationship with them. Certainly. Thank you. All right. Um, Paul and Jordan, thank you. Um, our next item, uh, which was an update on the Depot District Clean Fuels Technology, we're going to move to um, a future, uh, our next meeting, just uh, because of some time constraints and and appreciate those who were involved in that and their patience and, and uh, willingness to adjust. So thank you uh, for doing that. Um, that will take us to item number F, which is the roadway 
worker protection or RWP program manager and technical, which includes a technical budget adjustment. Um, Sheldon, welcome back. Chair, is my audio better now? It is. Oh, great. If we started the computer, hopefully that was what I needed to do. Well, thank you, Chair. So what I'm bringing forward is a, um, it's a discussion item, but I'm hoping it turns into a motion. And that motion would be to add a full-time employee to the safety department. That employee would be a roadway worker protection program manager. Um, the budget would come from operating budget contingency from 2021. I um, anticipate that being 60,500. That would cover seven months worth of wages and benefits. To explain briefly what the RWP program is, that's um, regulatory compliance with 49 CFR part 214, which is railroad workplace safety. We have an obligation to protect our workers. They're out on the alignment and we have an obligation to protect those um, who need to do work in and around our alignment that are not our employees. Um, the mission of that um, rule really is the same as Operation Lifesaver, who is probably our best safety partner. And the mission of Operation Lifesaver is to reduce the likelihood of collisions between people and vehicles and trains through rail safety education. 214 program has the same goal exactly, except that we use policies and procedures and training to reduce those um, chances of an incident. To paint an accurate picture though, we're doing pretty well in the United States. Over the past five decades, we've had an 82% reduction in the number of train versus vehicle or pedestrian incidents, which is outstanding. Still though, every three hours a person or a vehicle is hit by a train. And because of the size and the weight and the stopping distances of those trains, oftentimes those are horrific tragedies. Um, so the FRA kind of likes us to use risk-based safety who is at risk with the RWP program? Well, for us, that's our employees who will go out and do maintenance on our right of way, both for front runner or tracks. And that's um, anticipated maintenance um, and upkeep, but also we have emergency repairs. And those are a particular concern because of the time pressure of folks out there doing that. Um, we had a lot of discussion today about extensions, about um, state of good repair projects. There. Um, and then just general construction projects along the Wasatch Front have all increased exponentially over the past few years and will continue to do so. And then illustration of that, if we take a look at yesterday afternoon, tracks activated permit number 1,883, and we're only um, into May so far. And so the work around our alignment is accelerating in, in itself concern. Um, we also have responsibility for those doing construction around us. And it's not just the construction that's done on our alignment, but it's construction near our alignment. Um, a tragedy that happened last month in Taiwan. And Taiwan has a great reputation in their rail system, but there was a crane that ended up sliding down an embankment and tipped over onto the rail line there. And out of that, 49 people died and over 200 were injured. And so even work being done around us is of concern. We call that potential to foul, and we make sure that those folks are aware of roadway worker protection, that they are trained, and that we stop them from doing things that might put our trains at risk. And so what would this position do, this RWP program manager? This is a quality assurance position. Um, I come from an aviation background, and we had quality assurance in, in everything that we would do there. This person would not only make sure that make sure our program is regulatory compliant, that our training program is regulatory compliant and adequate and, and people understand how to make themselves safe. But also this person is going to go out and check up on our RWICs and our watchman lookout. Um, as we activate permits, this person will do checks in our control rooms to make sure that we are not taking shortcuts. Um, we're going to make sure that uh, the people at job sites are trained, can show us that training. They're writing down what they're supposed to be doing to make themselves safe. and. And if need be, we're going to shut down job sites just as we do now, but it will have a full-time person assigned to that. In short, we want to make sure that shortcuts aren't being taken and that practical drift is not happening in our in our RWP program. Practical drift, meaning um, we do things differently than we're trained because it's quicker and easier. We need to follow training. We need to follow procedures, and that'll be this person's job. In addition, this will be our in-house expert because um, oversight, both FTA FRA have a lot of um, concern about this program. And so they do audits, they do spot checks. This will be our person who represents UTA for that program. 
So big picture, this is an opportunity for us to reduce some risk and to standardize our program. And so that's the request of staff and I standing by for any questions. Thank you, Sheldon, for that explanation. It's always, uh, always helpful. Any questions for Sheldon? I know we've had some briefing on this particular item previously. Uh, as Sheldon mentioned, it, it has the potential for motion. And uh, with that, I would enter, entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the road work, Roadway Worker Protection Program Manager and Technical Budget Adjustments as recommended. I'll second that. Thank you. I have a, a motion from Beth, seconded by Jeff, to approve the additional FTE and authorize the technical <laughs> budget adjustment as presented. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Sheldon. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Trustees. Um, would note that our next meeting will be on Wednesday, May the 26th, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to have the depot district update uh, come back then um, and appreciate the patience of those involved. Uh, we have two close uh, sessions or two items for close session. One is a uh, Closed session to discuss a, a strategy session to discuss pending and reasonably imminent litigation, uh, as well as discussion of the character, professional competence, or physical or mental uh, health of an individual. And um, those will both be on uh, different platforms. Um, and uh, uh, and then we'll come back. Uh, uh, we will take a, a seven minute break. Uh, yeah, before we begin the first uh, closed session at approximately 11.15. With that, I would entertain a, a motion to go into closed session for this purpose as so, stated. So, so move, Chair. Second. I have a motion from Jeff, seconded by Beth, to go into closed session. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, motion passes. We'll see everybody at uh, 11.15. Thanks. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no. The motion I was like, I just realized I didn't wait for the recording notification. My apologies. So. No, you're good. You're good, Beth. It is time for a motion for adjournment. Okay. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we adjourn. I'll second that. I have a motion from Beth, seconded by Jeff, uh, for adjournment. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Thanks, everybody, for a great meeting.